All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from sunny San Diego. Actually, a bit rainy San Diego, but um, <laughs> however, we do get rain once in a while. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Kim Curtis, who is in Denver, Colorado. How are you doing, Kim? Great. We're having rain here too, John. So there you go. Excellent. And Kim is a nationally recognized wealth management advisor and speaker and president and CEO of Wealth Legacy Institute. And you have developed a groundbreaking a groundbreaking work in developing a highly personal client centric planning model. Uh, and this model is now the cornerstone of the firm's holistic and highly successful approach to integrated wealth management the planning for life experience but what we're going to talk about today is is a very very interesting topic and i thank kim for bringing this topic to to my attention um and that is leaders balancing technology with humanity uh so first of all um kim how did this 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 subject and i think it's a it's a fantastic one because i think it's a huge challenge right now but uh tell me how you happened upon this one yeah, happy to. You know, I was uh, doing a podcast a couple months ago on leadership, and the question was asked of what is kind of the biggest disruption going on in the nature of my work, and also I was thinking of other practitioners or professions. Mm -hmm. And I talked about how the integration of technology uh, with leadership and and financial services, every I, I, almost every single industry, if you think about what we're what's happening today. Every industry is being disrupted by technology, uh, particularly particularly in fintech and financial advice. So that's how the conversation started, and it ended up being quite an interesting conversation. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely. Because if you think about it, I mean, you talk about uh, you know, financial services, or you even just think about it from a practical point of view. Of everybody's had this experience, right? Their their banking experience has completely changed. Uh, I mean, if you're if you are especially if you were born pre-internet and you remember those days, but even, even since the advent of like online banking stuff, now it's changed so much that it's almost like, you know, even when you go to a bank, even when you try to work with your bank, it's like a black hole these days. <laughs> I'm still surprised that they're building banks. Anytime I drive by and I see a new bank structure, I'm shocked. And I think who goes in there? Yeah, no, it's it is it's a great point, and I think that's where you know the intersection of of like technology and that is that, um, I mean, if you do go into a bank, and I had to go into one recently, I hadn't set foot in one for ages, and you see there's, you know, once upon a time there was a lot of experienced people. It was a career. I remember in I remember I grew up in Ireland, and I remember oh the, oh when somebody would say oh such and such got a job in the bank, it was a big deal. Like people said oh they're set for life, you know, because it was. And now you go in and you just see kind of kids in there, so. Uh, it's changed so dramatically. And I think that's the thing with technology, Kim. It's a, there's so much we can do with it. But I think in some places we're just we're just charging, forging ahead, and we're forgetting the people component. Yeah, that 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 whole, of course, the intersection with humanity. And I think that that is really true as it relates to how we show up in life. Uh, the nature of of my field as a practitioner is we need the technology as an entrepreneur it makes our life easier mm -hmm. on the other hand the relationship is really key and you and i had that conversation in the green room earlier as it relates to being in sales and to be that first person that that truly is purveyors of prosperity and without that relationship the technology is efficient but takes away from the human element and how do we bridge that human element to allow us to grow and be successful, not only individually, but also as practitioners and entrepreneurs. And I think there's several things around that. In the nature of my field, when I think of the planning for life experience, and if you had a pyramid, at the bottom of that pyramid is money. We all need money to do exchange. And so with the starting point of money is usually when someone comes to me and that to manage the money, but above that is, is goals because you integrate money portfolio integration with, with goals, financial planning. And if you'd integrate those well, that next item on the pyramid is life. And that's where you get mm -hmm. peace of mind. 
And if you can get to peace of mind, which is what we tend to do well, it allows you to have that space to breathe, to get to the pinnacle of that pyramid, which is impact. So it's money, goals, life, impact. And to have an extraordinary life uh, of meaning and purpose, which has nothing to do with technology, but all of those efficiencies of technology hopefully allow us to move up that pyramid, almost like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, sooner. Yeah, no, I think that's I think that's entirely I think that's entirely correct. Uh, but I think one of the challenges with it, as we said, is um, that sometimes technology is used internally and people build the technology or build the efficiencies to suit themselves as opposed to suit you know, the, the customer or the person they're trying to serve. Um, so I think that's uh, that's always a, a bad a bad starting point. But I think the other thing that's kind of cropped up now, and I think uh, it was happening before the pandemic, but the pandemic accelerated it. And I think that's the the craving for more human connection, and and particularly I think for authenticity from the people they're dealing with. I think people want to deal with authentic people. They're sick of all. They're sick of be all the fake stuff. They're sick of all, just like um, hyperbole. They just they just want to have honest, authentic conversations with a human, an empathetic human being. And touch, you know, the ability mm -hmm. to hug somebody again uh, mm -hmm. is big. You know, I just walked outside uh, uh, yesterday and the neighbor across the street came out and it was the first time that we actually had a chance to actually physically hug each other. Believe it or not, isn't that crazy? <laughs> And it felt yeah. so good. So the the authenticity of who we are, demonstrating that through communication um, and actions, help us be better human beings. Yeah, no, I, I, I absolutely does. And therefore, I think the the onus is on you when you start to leverage technology is to how and to your point earlier, mm -hmm. you know, technology is fantastic. Let's get rid of all this. Let's get rid of all the rote and routine and non product, you know, non lower value, shall we say, task, mm -hmm. and let's use the technology to give people more time to be people. Absolutely. It, 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 I mean, I don't know if we want to go into cryptocurrency or <laughs> sure. NFTs, but there, I mean, there are wonderful uses of technology that's beyond kind of getting rid of menial tasks to, to be more productive. I mean, when I think of cryptocurrencies, we think of them as coins, but actually the technology behind the coin is really where the value is. The reason Bitcoin has a coin attached to it is to pay for the miners to mm -hmm. legitimize the ledger. So if you think of blockchain and the separation of pretty much taking removing banks from a transaction that you could do international trade quickly uh, without that middleman of confirming your payment, that's sizable. That, that is groundbreaking to the extent of what the blockchain can do and finance. Imagine that technology in every single industry and how that mm. can transform the, uh, the, our ability to do all kinds of things. I even think of supply chain as a huge one uh, since we're you know, kind of feeling that from the last couple of years with the pandemic. So, and then with NFTs, non-fungible tokens, all of a sudden, things that used to be flat, like a PDF on the internet that anyone could copy, you now have artists that could get paid for their work by having an identification mark, digital identification mark, mm -hmm. that allows them to get paid for their art. That in itself is like a game changer. It changes from flat 2D to multi-dimensional and being able to get paid for your work fairly. So that's another whole new area of opportunity. So. And there's humanity attached to that too, depending on how you define art and creativity and ingenuity and mm -hmm. community. Yeah, no, that's it's, it's, there's a, those are fantastic examples because those are examples of, if you almost like, you know, democratization, if you like, of, and also it, removing removing those middle tiers, those intermediary, inter, intermediary tiers that exists in all, and you're right, not just in, in finance, but I mean, they exist in almost every industry. And it's, they're often like, as, I mean, it's great for those people in the middle when they're making their money and all that, but it's often a source of great inefficiency and frustration for the end user. 
You know, <laughs> years ago, I read this book um, and I'll have to remember the author uh, because it was so profound and it talked about technology interrupting us, our humanity. And what do we have left if in fact, our brains are being copied, so to speak, so that we get the ad in Facebook of what we just talked about or looked up earlier a week ago, and now they're selling us those things. So if you think about, so what he said in his last chapter of this book was consciousness. Now this sounds really kind of weird, but our ability to be mindful, no one can take away your consciousness. It's kind of like, um, remember that book, classic book, Think and Grow Rich. Mm -hmm. uh, and As a Man Thinketh, both of those yeah. books are, but particularly As a Man Thinketh, uh, talks about here he was in the concentration camp and he recognized that they could harm me in every single way, but they can't get into my mind. They can't get into what I'm thinking. And that's how I stayed alive and survived the concentration camp. Well, if you think about today, how we're showing up, if we take time to be mindful and know what we want when most of us don't really know what we want. And most of us spend time kind of bopping along in our days. And I think it wasn't until perhaps a pandemic that actually gave us a reset for many and a pause to actually have the time to think about what is it that we really want. And so being mindful allows us to get back in our bodies to recognize what do we need to get out of this experience? And how do I show up with all the luxuries of technology around me, if we're so lucky, uh, to do good or do, do something for the greater good? Because ultimately, you could have enormous success and have a failed retirement, have a failed life, if in fact you don't integrate um, who you are to serve others in some higher meaningful way. Yeah, no, I, I think you're so right on that. And I think uh, you touched upon something that uh, we've talked about sometimes here, and I, and I often mention it is that idea of purpose. And I think it's part of the issue is that a, a lot of people don't figure out what their purpose is. I mean, you may think, well, my purpose is to show up for work and to do this, this and this and, uh, you know, earn my check and go home and then I can do whatever. But that that's that's not really that's never going to that's never going to be enough and it's never going to get you through the hard times and all of that. So I think figuring out purpose, if you figure out your purpose, and I think the what you're talking about is a natural offshoot of that. I honestly think that if you don't figure out your purpose, that gets back to that Maslow's yeah. kind of hierarchy of need, so to speak, where you get to impact. Um, if you get to the place where you're integrating kind of you're not worried or stressed about money um, or worry about what's going on in your life, it then allows you, and hopefully some of the people are with the fire movement are doing that in their thirties or forties, mm -hmm. instead of waiting till they're 55 or 65, but you could have the money, but if you haven't taken time to figure out who you are and what you want, it would be a very failed early retirement or step off because no amount of rate of return is gonna create an extraordinary life. And if you haven't focused on the inner part of who you are, then there's never any amount of money that will be enough. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you. And I think that's where, as you said earlier about the technology part is like the technology should serve you. The technology should make everything you know easier for you and all of that. But also then it should it should enable you to figure it should enable you to put the best of you into whatever role you're in and whatever that is so figure out your purpose and then you know leverage tech you know companies leverage technology to allow people to use the skills and um, the, just the the capabilities that technology are never going to have let's face it technology is great like ai is great and everything but it's it's it doesn't allow for the nuance of humans put it that way Right, right. I mean, it gets back to switching technologies from Zoom to a different streaming service. Mm -hmm. um, it's because we're so tired of Zoom. We're tired of that interaction for the last two years of trying to connect or have Zoom happy hours or <laughs> Zoom yeah. birthday parties, Zoom funerals. Uh, it's been mm -hmm. really difficult.
Yeah, yeah. No, it, it's uh, actually funny you should it's funny you should mention that. What's so funny? But it's uh, my during the a couple of years ago, my my during the, the beginning of the pandemic and stuff, my my mother did pass away, not from COVID, just from old age. Mm -hmm. And I managed. I was fortunate enough. I was managed to get back to Ireland just because I'm a dual citizen. So it's the only way. I was one of these rare people who could get into another country and then get back into the states. <laughs> so I could fortunate. travel when. Yeah, very fortunate. But anyway, having said that. Um, you know, my brother at the time, uh, he was in Peru. There were some people elsewhere. And so, yeah, it was a live streamed funeral. And there was only a limited amount of people who could be in the church anyway because of COVID rules. But yeah, it was a, it was a live stream funeral. So you're, you're, you're correct on that. But I think now what people are, are, are realizing is that there's no such thing as a, as a one size fits all technology. Like Zoom is great for some things, mm -hmm. but if you want to do other things, it's not. And I think that's going to happen more and more where we're going to see more and more kind of point solutions coming out that are very much dedicated to a particular thing. Like this is a podcasting video podcasting platform we're on now. That's what it's built for. That's what it's built to do. It's built to live stream and record. Uh, and I think we're going to see a lot more of that and probably a lot of the, you know, generic or ubiquitous kind of technologies will start to take a back seat. Yeah, it will be interesting to see as we progress, um, because each generation has their own different experience. Um, my 21 and 24 year old have very different experiences and embrace technology full on. I think that as people age, particularly what I see when they enter retirement is the success or failure part of that in their retirement is that they need to stay connected in some way. They need to stay current on technology because if they stop or step aside, they get left behind. Mm -hmm. And that is so important to allow as we, as one of the things I would suggest to anyone that chooses to step off in some way or slow down or disengage or retire is to stay connected with technology so they do not get left behind. Yeah, I think that's a that's a that's an excellent point. And and I mean, I think the uh, the technologies are kind of lending themselves to that a little bit now more. It's easier to stay up on them because they've become a little, you know, they're becoming more user friendly all the time. But it's funny going back to what you were just saying about the the younger people coming through now. It's funny. It's like we had to learn the technology. I think they'll have to learn the human interaction bit. <laughs> <laughs> it's a switch, you know, yeah. and we're, we're trying to hang on on technology. I'm trying to hang on on technology mm -hmm. and, and yet I'm trying to teach them how to show up and look someone in the eye and shake their hand. And hopefully I'm past that stage, but, but that whole personal piece of showing up and being present when you're having a conversation with them, uh, with someone else is kind of something that we have to teach now. No, no, and we do. And I mean, I'm fortunate. My 17 year old son, um, he acts as well as other things. So he has learned all that kind of stuff, you know, through through the years. But I mean, I see with other other people, it doesn't come naturally. I mean, that is something that's a that's a learned a learned behavior and they're not learning it from their peers. So I guess that's the gift we have to give the next generation is to help them. You know, they can help us with, you know, can you help me with this? This doesn't seem to be working. There's something wrong with my computer. OK, if they can help us with that, then we can help them with the here's how you show up. That's right. And hopefully and hopefully help them with money because we're not as good at helping them with managing money either. And so I hope that we do a better job of sharing with our young adults how to be successful financially, because with the amount of students that have school loan debt and to start off with that debt um, is significant these days. And it's interesting to know whether that trade-off makes sense anymore to have that kind of debt for a degree. So that's another whole conversation. We don't need to go there, mm -hmm. but in terms of teaching what's kind of missing as, as this technology integration and humanity, um, the whole education construct is another whole area to explore in terms of disruption. Yeah, no, you're, you're hundred percent right. And yeah, we could, we could totally get into the whole university thing because I um, I think it's it's totally overpriced and the, the, the value is not there. Um, they haven't modernized, to be honest at all. It's funny, somebody mentioned the other day, um, my son actually mentioned it too, saying that there was this very successful guy on YouTube who does whatever. Uh, he said he went to he went to college 
for marketing is a waste of time. They're not covering anything of the the marketing that we do today. So I think that's yeah, that's a <laughs> that's a whole whole other conversation. But I think an extremely extremely important one. But I do think yeah, that there is a question now. The jobs of the future, some of them aren't even created yet, or they're kind of evolving. Right? And and education is, is is lagging behind. And yeah, what a great way to start your life is with the with the a debt hanging over your your head for perhaps a degree that's not really worth that much to you. Unless you're a communication or sales major. Well, that's the other thing that I did want to mention. Glad you reminded me there because I kind of went off topic this in my head. But um, we work with DePaul University in Chicago and they have a sales program. But here's the interesting thing. They teach their students CRM sales enablement technology so they teach them all the technologies not just the sales stuff they teach them the technologies and they use the technologies in their in the classroom in doing their um their projects etc so this is this is one of the first times when you're actually getting that even combination because i think even in some you know marketing disciplines they don't even get into marketing technology right that's true well in, in financial services a lot of universities are teaching trading when people aren't really trading in the way that they're teaching anymore. Uh, most people are using broad, low-cost indexing to gather their portfolio structure. And so to teach trading in the way that was done in the 50s is truly obsolete. So, so how do we teach money behavior and teach marketing behavior in a way that we can then hire people that actually can do the jobs that we have available for them? Yeah, I know. I I totally agree. And I mean, if you think about kind of your your son, your your, your kids, and mine, I mean, the, the way they approach money. I mean, they, I mean, number one, cash is kind of a bit strange to them. They rarely, can, you know, they'll say, they "Oh, can you?" It. Yeah, yeah. They say, say, "Oh, can you buy me lunch? I'll Venmo you the money later or whatever." I mean, they it's so it's so casual and in and in it's just very different. It's just very different. And you're right. I think that's great, but they still need to learn the basic because they still don't have the basic financial literacy skills to back it up. Right. You know, I, I, Hey, I'm a Venmo expert having two young adults in my family, <laughs> <laughs> but that gets back to staying current on technology, you yeah. know, sure. I'll Venmo you, honey. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Staying current on, on, on technology and then sort of understand at the same time, understanding the, fu the fundamentals of finance, which you mentioned earlier, which I don't think a lot of people do. And that's not, I mean, I'm amazed today. It's still not, taught in in high school like financial literacy as a mandatory class for everybody you know it's interesting when we talk you know how i talked about that pyramid earlier mm -hmm. there there truly are two two kinds of money or two laws of money and and one is the natural laws and the other is human made laws and the human made laws are what we're talking about now which is tied to financial planning and and kind of making sure that you you budget and get an app that allows you to track your spending and once you use that app, use it well, because it actually identifies where your money goes. And so there's lots of things to make it easier to be more successful in the starting out of learning money. Because remember, at least my parents and grandparents, they didn't have to handle money. They had a pension. And mm -hmm. so when they stepped off, they got money sent to them every month. And that's what they lived off of when they stepped off. Now today, the, the baby boomers were the experiment of the 401k plans and being responsible for your own retirement. So that whole managing money just rose right to the top and the baby boomers were not prepared to have that responsibility of teaching that to their children. So we have this big disconnect and yet we now have technology, hopefully tied up to humanity as it relates to allowing us to be better spenders, to identify where that money goes and to then direct it to goals that are meaningful and purposeful to us versus just going along in life, not really knowing, thinking we need to own a house, thinking we need a brand new car, thinking that we need all of these markers of success mm -hmm. when they are not markers to my children as much as they were to say the baby boomers or these rites of passages along the way. 
Yeah, that's 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 a fantastic point. I mean, yeah, I, I really think it, it's changing. Those markers are changing, and and I think that's that. Yeah, that's the responsibility that we have is to understand the markers of the next generation coming up and to help them. Listen, Kim, this has been fantastic. Right, the time is time has flown. So all of Kim's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. Yes, I'm the CEO of Wealth Legacy Institute, and we are a financial advisory firm that helps people that have been saving all their life from saving for to living in retirement in that transition. And we're out of Denver, Colorado, and I'm an author of two best-selling books, Money Secrets, Keys to Smart Investing, and Retirement Secrets, Keys to Retiring Happy, Healthy, and Free, that kind of identifies some of those things, John, that we talked about earlier. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I'd, I'd highly recommend that uh, the people go ahead and, and read that. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you can, please do leave a comment. And of course, share with other people as well. So listen, thanks again, Kim. Thank you for watching and listening. And I will see you all again really soon. Thank you. Yeah.